Market to Market is everywhere you are. Subscribe to Market to Market on YouTube, find us on the PBS video app to stream on demand, and add our three podcasts on your favorite podcasting app. Coming up on Market to Market, the problems at the port come to Congress. Countries vow to cut coal from their energy diet. The tug of war over authority to address Iowa's water quality. About a 33% retracement. And market analysis with Ted Seifert next. What's the most complex industry on Earth? It's not genetics, or meteorology, or logistics. It's a business that involves them all. It's farming. Thank you, farmers, from Pioneer. Tomorrow, for over 100 years, we've worked to help our customers be ready for tomorrow. Trust in tomorrow. Information is available from a Grinnell Mutual agent today. This is the Friday, November 5 edition of Market to Market, the weekly journal of rural America. Hello, I'm Paul Yeager. What is October? appears to be the answer to the question of when will the American worker return to employed status. The Labor Department reported Friday 531,000 jobs were added last month, offering a sign recovery is overcoming a virus-induced slowdown. The unemployment rate dropped two-tenths of a point to 4.6 percent and edged closer to the pre-pandemic mark of 3.5 percent. UAW employees at Deere & Company again rejected a new contract offer. The Moline, Illinois-based manufacturer said after the vote that that was their best and final offer. Transitory and tapering were the words of the week from the Federal Reserve. Chair Jerome Powell stressed patience on rates and inflation as the Fed announced reducing monthly bond purchases. Purdue University's Ag Economy Barometer recorded a lower reading than a month before. The producer's sentiment dropped three points to 121. The revenue picture for the world's biggest shipping company, AP Moeller Maersk, is up dramatically. The Denmark-based company reported third quarter earnings jumped 68 percent from the same quarter last year. Many shipping containers bearing that company's logo sit on ships or offshore ports, waiting for semi-trucks to move those goods across this country. The bottleneck was the subject of a congressional hearing this week. Here's Peter Tubbs with more. I am very, very worried. I'm worried that we could possibly have a delay in our, a major delay in our food supply chain if we do not address this piercing issue of a need for commercial truck drivers. Delays in supply chains have made life difficult for American agriculture and the producers of food, fuel, fiber, and feed. This week, the House Agriculture Committee held a hearing to learn where many of the problems in the food supply chain are occurring. A lack of truck drivers was a common complaint. We are in a supply chain crisis. The U.S. ports we rely on are backed up, and products needed for farming, such as tractor tires and computer chips, are waiting to be unloaded. There are not enough drivers, warehouses, chassis, and shipping containers to keep the product moving to their intended customer, which in this case is the American farmer. I believe our economist looks at uh, the number of, of 80,000 short after the pandemic. A loosening of trucking rules is one solution for moving goods through the food system. Policies enacted during the pandemic are set to expire. What are the potential impacts on the supply chain um, on everything from cattle processing to stocking grocery store shelves? It's been an incredibly important tool. I was talking about our, our member wholesalers yesterday. It was just remarking that the flexibility that this uh, you know, emergency has given them uh, has allowed them to get orders that otherwise might have been left on a distribution center dock to the store. Another pinch point in the U.S. supply chain are American ports. International shippers loading ships to Asia will frequently refuse loaded cargo containers in favor of empty containers, which are earning shipping rates multiple times more valuable than containers full of products. 
Freight rates from the Asia and the U.S. West Coast are currently 15 times higher than freight rates from the U.S. to Asia, creating a clear financial incentive for ships who depart empty with no U.S. goods on board versus waiting to be loaded. As a result, shipping companies are refusing to load U.S. agricultural exports, and over 70% of the containers are returning to Asia empty. How long has ongoing port congestion affected food and agriculture trade involving either U.S. imports or exports from your vantage point? We noticed the increase back in the late, what I would call late 2020, when it started to really see the impact. Uh, and really became acute right at the end of the year to the beginning of the year of 2021 and has gotten continually to get, get what I call worse. A bill currently in committee will create oversight on the shipping industry, specifically looking for identification of any anti-competitive or non-reciprocal trade practices by ocean common carriers. Companies looking to export their goods welcome the oversight but are worried that the proposed legislation will take months or years to take effect, doing little to resolve the bottlenecks companies are experiencing today. For Market to Market, I'm Peter Tubbs. Coal and methane were two of the biggest topics this week at the Global Climate Summit in Scotland. Much of the action was non-binding, as John Torpy reports. But this year... Many of the world's bigger countries, several of the generally acknowledged polluters among them, gathered in Glasgow, Scotland this week, making pledges to be better environmental citizens. Several major coal-using countries announced Thursday at the United Nations Climate Summit they would slowly wean themselves off the use of the fossil fuel. It's clear to us all uh, that to keep uh, 1.5 degrees uh, in reach, uh, we need to consign coal to history. The promises made come at a time when energy prices for natural gas and oil have been rising in light of increased demand. Major economies like the United States, China, India, and Japan have yet to set a date for ending their dependence on these energy sources. However, China was a no-show at the event this week. Presidents from Brazil and Russia also were absent. Important as this pledge is, the U.S. did not attend the summit under the Trump administration. Also at this week's event, a pledge to cut methane emissions and end deforestation. Promises like these have been made before and, according to skeptics, readily broken. For Market to Market, I'm John Torpy. During the growing season, the weather report matters to the day-to-day -day operation of any farm. Missed precipitation causes issues later, but the big rains bring their own immediate set of concerns of erosion or runoff. What's in the soil is vulnerable to the gully washers for both urban and rural settings. Nutrients can be lost and contribute to point and non-point source pollution. Josh Bittner reports on the tug of war over water quality in this week's cover story. Iowa is a national leader in several farm commodities but collateral damage in the form of runoff impaired waterways has brought several legal actions aimed at stopping pollution linked to agriculture. Because our lawsuit went away, the Raccoon River did not clean up. The Des Moines River did not clean up. There's still nutrient contamination that still needs to be addressed and we want to have those conversations. Ted Corrigan is current CEO and general manager of Des Moines Waterworks, which sued farm drainage districts upstream in 2015 unsuccessfully over excess nitrates the utility must remove in order to deliver federally compliant clean drinking water. Critics charge excess fertilizers and manure applied at the same rate can build up during drought when stagnant waters are prone to increased algae blooms and later flush out of fields with ever wetter spring rains. As needed, Waterworks employs their mammoth but aging nitrate removal facility, which costs around $10,000 per day to operate. The plant hasn't run in over three years. Still, plans are to spend millions more drilling riverside wells to mitigate expected nutrient surges. But we're never going to be off the river. We are always going to need direct surface water at Des Moines Waterworks, and so we are always going to fight for water quality. Scientists have long tied farm pollutants in the Mississippi River watershed to the Gulf of Mexico's seasonal low oxygen hypoxic zone. In response, Iowa adopted the Nutrient Reduction Strategy in 2013, 
whose own science assessment found over 90% of the state's nutrient flows of nitrate and phosphorus were generated through agriculture. This is a nitrate sensor. Chris Jones is a research engineer with the University of Iowa who maintains a statewide network of 70 stream bank monitoring sites. The real-time data they harvest helps chart progress toward the state's water quality objectives. We have a problem of scale. We're trying to farm, you know, every piece of farmable land uh, pretty much in the state. We're trying to raise, you know, 25 million hogs at any one time and however many cattle and 80 million laying chickens. Jones says the proliferation of highly efficient farm drainage tiles expedites increased water-soluble nutrients into nearby streams. Though some in the field have adopted conservation methods which help harness efficiencies, improve margins, and crack niche markets, he remains pessimistic. Can we ever get the water quality we want at the scale at which we're doing things right now? I would say no, we cannot. Relatively low policy uptake, no timetable for the state's 45% nutrient reduction goal, and what they call a lack of accountability in the program, helped lead D.C.-based environmental advocacy group American Rivers to add Central Iowa's Raccoon River to their top 10 list of the nation's most endangered waterways in 2021. The move ruffled some feathers. That report itself, the way that those types of reports come out with no basis, it was, they were nominated by an activist group here in Iowa. It's all about trying, it's a fundraising plea for this organization. Again, they can do that. I'm not saying they can't, but, but if you want to talk facts, you have to ignore a lot of evidence, a lot of evidence that says we're moving in the right direction. My response to Secretary Nag and to anybody that would dismiss us as, as uh, you know, radical or on the fringe is that there's nothing radical about clean water. Adam Mason is the former state policy organizing director for Iowa Citizens for Community Improvement. Iowa CCI was a plaintiff in another lawsuit, dismissed this summer, which sought mandatory water quality regulations and a moratorium on what Mason calls new factory farms. Recent reports have shown that this voluntary nutrient reduction strategy could take ultimately thousands of years to get to the level of water quality that we need and that Iowans deserve. We believe that farmers do know what's best for their farms, but what we do also believe is that every farmer's got to participate. Both cases unraveled after top judges found the judiciary holds no authority to craft new laws. For the second time now, the Iowa Supreme Court has returned the question to the legislature, and we really think that it is the legislature's job to take up the question of water quality and make some meaningful change to improve the situation. We didn't start all of a sudden, one day we had dirty water. I would challenge anybody to find a farmer that isn't concerned about water quality and is trying to do the right thing. State of Iowa Representative Lee Hine is a past chair of the Iowa House Agriculture Committee and raises cattle, hogs, and several hundred acres of row crops over 150 miles northeast of the state capitol. He served in the State House when the nutrient reduction strategy was introduced and admits, though the plan isn't legislation, lawmakers and officials have worked tirelessly to secure funds for its water quality initiatives. We do a lot of different things, whether it's waterways, terraces, the bioreactors or the saturated buffers. These are not things that we can just everybody put in this year and we have clean water next year. It, it takes time, it takes finances. Heinz says the variety of Iowa's agricultural landscapes are too complex for one-size-fits-all mandates, but touts successful manure management plans regulated through the Iowa Department of Natural Resources. However, in September, environmental group Sierra Club, in a legal appeal, accused the DNR of violating their own rules by approving an allegedly flawed nutrient management plan of a concentrated animal feeding operation, or CAFO expansion, near the headwaters of a prized Northeast Iowa cold water trout stream. Researchers report the highest concentrations of nitrate in state waterways near livestock operations. It's at Bloody Run Creek where the new CAFO is. One of the things that I have learned of being in the legislature, no matter what the issue is, there's always at least two sides to a story, and sometimes I'll tell them three and four. As divided camps head toward another potential stalemate, some seek the middle ground. But consumer watchdogs and grassroots organizations warn if nutrient reduction efforts don't accelerate, Iowa taxpayers will foot the bill for rising costs associated with clean water. For Market to Market, I'm Josh Bittner. 
Next, the Market to Market Report. Better harvest weather and less moisture along with energy sources tugged at the trade. For the week, the nearby wheat contract shed six cents while the December corn contract lost 15 cents. Heavy resistance testing in the soy complex as South American beans are racing to completion and being ready for export. The January soybean contract weakened by 44 cents. December meal added a dime per ton. December cotton expanded to 02 per hundredweight. Over in the dairy parlor, December class three milk futures fell 96 cents. A green week in the livestock sector, December cattle added 252. January feeders improved by 347. And the December lean hog contract strengthened 47 cents. In the currency markets, U.S. dollar index improved 21 ticks. December crude oil decreased 201 per barrel. COMEX Gold expanded 3280 per ounce, and the Goldman Sachs Commodity Index fell more than six points to finish at 580.50. Now here to provide insight is regular market analyst Ted Seifert. Hello, Ted. Hello, Paul. I'm, I'm looking at my questions to figure out where to start with you because, as always, there's always something. I mentioned weather in wheat. Is that the biggest story um, in wheat right now it, domestically? I mean... Weather is always a big story for wheat. I mean, we have wheat growing pretty much all the time. Uh, I don't know. Yeah, uh, it's something that we're watching. We also are looking at this USDA report that we have on Tuesday. We're not expecting any big changes for that. Uh, and we're also watching the U.S. dollar, which broke out into new highs here this week, uh, new recent highs, and is looking like it wants to go higher. That is a bit of a headwind for wheat. But if you look at how wheat traded this week, it was really tied into what was going on in the row crops. And I think wheat overall has, has a, a, enough of a bullish fundamental story behind it to continue to go higher in a bullish overall grain market complex. But with a stronger dollar, and if the row crops are going to go lower and we're gonna have a bit of a bearish period in the row crops, I'm not necessarily saying we are. We'll get to that, obviously. That's you know, what we're doing here. But if we're in a bearish climate, can wheat go higher? And that's the question that I'm asking, and I'm not sure it can. Uh, you gotta say, the wheat prices are really very good, especially when you look at you know, Minneapolis. I don't know if there's a tremendous amount of do downside potential for the wheat, so like from a percentage basis, wheat should fare a lot better than corn or soybeans. But in a bearish climate, you gotta think that wheat prices can come down from these lofty levels that we're at. Okay, last week, asked Sean Hackett about how high wheat seven, eight, nine, and he did say, yeah. Do you see that? Uh, well, you know, December Chicago, we went and flirted with the $8 mark. Um, that was sort of my upside target. So in, in my book, we've kind of completed the target that we needed to based on the fundamentals. Now, can we go higher? I, we usually go further than what I, what I would consider fair value, it, whether it's up or down or whatever. You know, market takes a ball and runs with it. But like we were just talking about, are we going to continue to run with that ball like we usually would mm -hmm. in a climate where corn and beans seem to want to go lower? So I don't know. We might have hit the highs. I was looking for 11 and a quarter for December Minneapolis wheat. We didn't quite get there, uh, but that's acting toppy too. So I don't know. Um, yeah, I mean, can we hit eight dollar wheat December Can't Chicago? Yeah, pretty much. But but now, do we? What do we have to do from here? I mean, we've already kind of hit the upside objectives that most of yeah. us had. Okay. All right, uh, the bears in corn, mm. is that where they're at? Soybeans, very much so. Okay, so what's in corn then right now? I mean, harvest pressure, one, I mean, maybe it's a little better harvest than we thought. Yes. That's... And is that what's going to be reflected Tuesday? Okay, right. So you've got a real tug of war happening in corn, one from outside markets. Soybeans want to kind of pull everything down. Wheat wants to kind of try to pull everything higher. Corn's kind of sitting in the middle going, I don't know what to do. Because corn's individual fundamentals are a bit of a tug of war too, because like you said, we are noticing that this crop was probably better than we were expecting, certainly a lot better than what some of us were expecting in June or July. Um, I think we have a record national average yield for corn. So I do think the USDA is going to move the corn yield higher or should move the corn yield higher on this November report. If they don't, I really think it has to go higher further on down the line. I have it going up by half a bushel an acre to a 177, but I could see it even going higher than that potentially. Uh, so we're trying to balance the bigger supply with some fairly good demand, especially when it comes to ethanol. Ethanol has been rocking and rolling and that is fantastic to see. Ethanol is the bright spot of the corn balance sheet. Again, I love when that happens. You know, you know 
a lot of people know, ethanol is, is something that's kind of near and dear to me uh, because of what I like to do with it with cars, right? Uh, we, I, we can talk <laughs> about that, too. That's a whole other thing. I just I've did I've only that. got like five minutes left, and I could, you could just yeah. talk about tires for five. All right, yeah. I have a question about something you said before. Uh, that, that someone wants to ask. Zach in Lawrence, Nebraska. By the way, thank you for all the great questions. Ted yes, loves them. I do. Uh, in amongst all the car tweets. Zach and Lawrence <laughs> asked, three reasons not to sell 560 cash corn delivered in January. And he says, it might go to $7, doesn't count. So he wants three reasons. Yeah. Well, first of all, I think you should sell that and then use call strategies to reown it. Let's get that out of the way. Uh, if I weren't selling corn right now, the three reasons that I would have is, one, ethanol is really very strong, and that's fantastic. Two, the input cost uh, conversation that the market is having right now, the market seems to think that we're going to see a big shift towards soybean acres because of in input costs. I don't necessarily believe, believe in that so much. Uh, let's see where input costs are in the spring, but at least let the market believe that for now. And then the big one that I don't think very many people are talking about, if we're going to have this input cost conversation, we should be talking about that second season safranic corn crop. We're going to find out a lot about this input cost problem before we even start to think about planting, and it's gonna come down in South America. Okay, so the bear story, the soybean story. You mentioned something right there in corn that could be, is that the bear, one of the bear, the leading bears, biggest bears in beans, and it being the acreage. Is it is that a big bear, or is it South America, or is it C? Yeah, so it's, it's all the above, right? So I guess D. Um, the fact of the matter is the bean story has changed dramatically in the last two months. A couple months ago, we were thinking, hey, last year's carryover was a 150, and this year is going to be maybe even tighter. Then we added a whole bunch of bushels to production for last year. We ended up with a 256 million bushel carryover. It wasn't nearly as tight as we were expecting. That also means bigger beginning stocks coming into this year. And now our thoughts of this year's carryover are, well, the average trade guess is a little over 360 million bushels for this report that's coming out on Tuesday. That's a much different narrative than what we were talking about not that long ago. So that's caused a lot of bearish price action. Plus, on top of that, throw the idea of potentially more acreage coming. The fast pace of planting down in South America that's happening, which is usually good for yields. So all that bearish news hitting soybeans at the same time is what's got soybeans really on the defense and really standing on the edge of the abyss looking down and potentially looking at a bigger drop to the downside. Okay. Now, we might need to do something like that, as I've been talking about for months, to go and find that demand. But it might not have to happen either, because look at soybean meal, like you said earlier, up $10. Uh, soybean meal has the potential to create a soybean rally, even with a larger balance sheet. There is that possibility. I think there's only about a 30% chance of that happening. I think more likely we do have to go lower. We could talk about what price my target is. I, I have we could, I do, but I need to get to, yes. to the meats quick. Uh, we'll, we're going we're gonna to talk all about numbers in Market Plus. There's a tease. Ted has a piece of paper he's yes. going to show and give you some exact estimates, so come into Market Plus. Uh, soy meal, when it has an impact on the hog market right now, right. is that something that's going to be the biggest eater of this uh, demand or the supply? Yes. We have less hogs out there than what we had originally thought. However, uh, weights are gaining, so you know that means we're kind of a little bit backed up. That means we have to feed more. And the soybean meal market is fairly tight. Uh, I think crush margins are going to start getting better because I think soybean meal is going to start getting better. And soybean oil, I think, has limited downside uh, potential simply because veg oils globally are really very strong. And crude oil on Friday was back up another 2 $3. So from the biodiesel perspective, soybean oil is, is in demand as well. The products of soybeans, I think, look pretty good. That crush margin, I think, is going to get quite a bit better, and I think we'll see improvement on the crush. Okay. For hogs, uh, yeah, higher input costs. Yes, we're backing up, but there are less animals out there. Demand is really good. Cutout values are fairly strong. Can we keep up, keep up that strength is a question mark. Either way, I see hog values going higher. The December, I think, should be trading in the mid to low 80s. We're a ways away from that. Um, may, might not happen in the next week or two, but I think over time we'll shoot for those levels. Is the feed story the biggest uh, factor in the lives or in the feeders uh, cattle market story? Well, I mean, yeah, you put some pressure on corn, and it's interesting to see how the feeder cattle market really reacts to that in a positive way, and that's good. Um, a little bit of relief coming there. So yes, we are seeing the feeders kind of turn around and go higher, but also you know look at fat cattle, and you know we have some fairly decent values out there. There's optimism that that cash can move higher. Packers margins are good. Uh, that cash is really. 
been in a, in a range. I don't know if it does break out to the outside, and I don't know if Feb Fat Cattle can break out from that 130, 140 range that we've been in. We're creeping up towards the higher end of that range, so it looks like we want to test it out and find out. But I'm a little skeptical that we will. Okay. All right, Ted, thank you so much. Uh, that'll do it for this installment. But here's the thing. We have a ton from Ted when it comes to uh, exact estimates and a lot of questions that came from you, the viewers. So thank you very much. We will talk more in Market Plus, so that is available in podcast form. And you can find that on our website, of markettomarket.org. And here's the thing. There's nothing wrong with following on occasion. Let's talk podcasts, for example. We have three offerings here. We have the Market Analysis, which you just heard, the Market Plus, which we're going to record in a moment, and that's after the TV show, and the MTOM, Conversations and Behind-the-Scenes Information from the production of this program. Follow all three where you get your podcasts. And now next week, we will look at the rising costs of inputs. Always a story, and we'll have that for you next week. So thank you so very much for watching the TV show. Have a great week, and we'll see you next time. Market to Market is a production of Iowa PBS, which is solely responsible for its content. What's the most complex industry on Earth? It's not genetics, or meteorology, or logistics. It's a business that involves them all. It's farming. Thank you, farmers, from Pioneer. Tomorrow, for over 100 years, we've worked to help our customers be ready for tomorrow. Trust in tomorrow. Information is available from a Grinnell Mutual agent today.